Well, everyone, thanks so much for joining. Um, this is our second info session. Today's January 10th, um, and this is a student payroll experience. And we're so excited that you're all here, and we have a lot of current students who have a lot of great things to say. So just as a reminder, this session is being recorded, um, and the format is that uh, we'll go through a little introduction um, and general info about our program, and then we will have the student panel itself. And then there's also a questions and answers button uh, that you should see at the bottom of your screen. And throughout the session, you can place your questions in there and then we'll address those towards the end. And you can ask any matter of questions. But while you have the current students here, feel free to ask things you're curious about. What is it like being a student? OK. So um, first, I would like to introduce Dr. Kelsey Berry. She is uh, our associate faculty director of our master's program, and she's also the co-director of our virtual master's program of bioethics. So Dr. Berry, could you say a few words? Thanks so much, Jesse. We are really thrilled to be able to do this panel with our current students. Um, I know that many of you are probably thinking about what it looks like to get a master's degree in bioethics and what it would be like to actually join us on campus, whether that would be in person or virtually. And there's really no better expert on that than the students who are doing it right now and who were in fact in the seats that you sit in uh, just about a year or two ago. Um, so we have some fantastic students who will take you through some of their experiences in the program and their thoughts about why it is they chose to pursue a master's degree in bioethics. Um, I will just say, uh, I'm gonna sit in the background of this particular session. Um, I love to tell people about the curriculum of the program I love to tell them about the uh, nitty gritty of what it looks like to learn bioethics at Harvard Medical School, um, but today is not my day. So I'm here to answer any questions should they be pertinent for me. But in the meantime, we're really uh, excited to hear from our wonderful students who will reflect a wide variety of different ways of engaging <coughs> the program. Um, so if you're interested in a master's of science in bioethics, if you're interested in Harvard Medical School, which I assume you are because you're here, and this is a great opportunity to learn a little bit more. Uh, Dr. Brendel, our program director, will try to join us a little bit later um, and say hello to all of you. But in the meantime, uh, sit back, relax, and hear a little bit from our students as you learn about the Masters of Science in Bioethics. Welcome. <clears throat> so as you can tell, uh, so our program is we offer one year, we offer two year, um, and we also offer virtual. And that virtual option is our part time two year. Uh, all of our class sizes for those are between 30 and 40 students. And then a part, you know, an integral part of your program is what we call the foundation class. Um, and that's between 30 and 40 students. But the other sign of that is all the elective classes that you can choose to take um, and really shape part of your curriculum. And those classes can range anywhere between 10 and 25 students. Um, and like most, most, most master's programs, this is 36 credits. Uh, and part of that is a really kind of in-depth personalized capstone experience um, that we hope you can you know, take with you for the rest of your career. Our semesters are September to May, and so if you do two years, it's two of that. And um, if you are a virtual student, we do have an option for you to come study in January for an intensive course, and it's a class that just lasts a few weeks. Um, these are our students. Currently, we have just about 122 students, 120 students, 32 of which are full-time, um, and they come from around the world. Uh, many different professional backgrounds. Uh, our students are clinicians, they're lawyers, they're pastors, they're public health and public law professionals. Um, they're working in the pharmaceutical industry or they're taking a gap year from med school. Some of our students are also just starting their career. They've just graduated undergrad. Um, and then some have been in their professions for 20 plus years. So in the classroom, you'll really see a lot of unique perspectives, right? Maybe it's someone who's younger, or maybe it's somebody who's really, really experienced clinician. Um, and I'm excited that we have some of our current students here to share those experiences with you. So life at Harvard, um, you can study here in Boston. Uh, Harvard Medical School is located on the Longwood campus. Um, and the main campus is, of course, in Cambridge. 
And so if you were to be here full time as a full time student uh, studying in person, you can live right here on campus um, at a place called Vanderbilt Hall, and that would be right next to your classes. Um, or you could live in Cambridge and you could commute in, right? There's a free shuttle. Or you can live anywhere in the general area. Um, <clears throat> but I'm not going to talk too much about this part of why we're having this panel so that you can hear directly uh, from our students what it's like living in Boston um, and being here at Harvard. So uh, with that, um, we're just going to go ahead and start. We hope to have a discussion um, for 30 minutes. We want to hear uh, unique perspectives and we want to hear about experiences. Um, and yeah, we want to hear again, what is it like to be here in Boston and here at Harvard? I'm going to pass it off to Kosti, who is a current student and has generously um, agreed to be our moderator. So Kosti, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jesse. Can you all hear me OK? All right. uh, I am, I'm Kosti. I, my full name is Konstantin Simopoulos. I am a kinesiologist by training, and I have been involved with sport medicine uh, in the past and also the, the Olympic medicine. So human performance at the elite level of, of sport. I am uh, a second year part-time student, and although I'm virtual, I'm also local because I've been in the Cambridge area, my family and I, for almost two decades now. So I'm very happy uh, to be moderating this panel of, of my colleagues and students. So I would like to ask each one of the students to um, introduce themselves briefly, starting with uh, Rigo. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Kosti. My name is Rigo Azanui, and I am in the second year MBA program, and uh, I am virtual. I do the program all the way from York, Pennsylvania, but at the moment, I am in Boston taking one of those intensive courses for the JTERM that Jesse mentioned earlier. So even though I'm a virtual student, there's still an opportunity to, to take a class in person, which I'm doing right now. Thank you very much, uh, Desi. Thank you, Kosti. Hi, everyone. It's great to be with you today for this one hour. My name is Desi. Uh, I'm a first year virtual part-time student. I'm a lawyer by training and actually in private practice and also a poli policy researcher in the field of uh, AI and uh, emerging technologies. I'm based in Europe. I'm taking the program out of uh, Eastern Europe. Um, and I'm very happy to tell you anything you would like to know and I can be helpful with as far as the program is concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Desi. Sunny. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sunny Jung. I'm a full-time in-person student uh, located in Boston. Um, I'm a pediatric nurse and researcher by background, and we're so excited to have you all. Please let us know any questions that you have. Thank you, Sunny. And last but definitely not least, Adam. Uh, good morning. My name is Adam. I am uh, a British pediatrician who has uh, made the trip over to Boston to complete the one year uh, MBE in person um, program. And I'm delighted to be here with, with um, some esteemed colleagues. Thank you so much, Adam and everyone. So I will start with the, I will start us off with the first question. And uh, I will. Uh, I would like to ask Rigo to answer this. So Rigo, your you have one of your degrees is a master of divinity. You're a priest and a Capuchin monk. Uh, what was it that first got you interested in bioethics? So my first exposure to bioethics was during my undergrad when I took a course and uh, doing my masters of divinity. I was further exposed to biomedical ethics, and uh, I was captivated by a new technology which was upcoming in 2016, uh, CRISPR-Cas9, and uh, I was immediately thinking of what I could do with such a technology, and, and I thought, well, there's sickle cell disease, which, uh, you know, we can actually bring an end to it using this technology, but what are some of the ethical ramifications of using such a technology? And I thought, you know, to answer that question, I need to be somewhat an expert. So I started thinking, where can I become an expert in bioethics? And Harvard being the best, 
of the places to study at in the world, I thought that must be my first choice. So I uh, went ahead and applied when I had the opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Rigon. You actually answered another of my questions already, which is great. Uh, why Harvard? But I will proceed with Desi and ask, and ask you, you're a lawyer, you know, with a lot of uh, experience from the EU and AI, as you mentioned, in public policy. Uh, how can, uh, why, why, what made you pursue specifically a master's degree in the field of bioethics and not just continue with your own interests and add bioethics to what you were already doing? A very good question. Thank you, Kosti. Um, actually, um, AI as an emerging technology is currently not regulated, neither in, in the EU nor in, in the US. It is in the process of being regulated. And while the regulators and policymakers are struggling with various issues and the policy design and the regulation design around it, a lot of ethical question, questions pop up. And when I, while I was working and I'm working as a lawyer and policy researcher, I essentially experienced them firsthand. Then I realized that uh, apparently law is not uh, well suited to um, respond to any of the questions, let alone resolve them. We need a high order the system and that system would need to be um, ethical. We need to look to ethics uh, in order to be able to uh, at least try to understand what perspective we need to take on some of those issues. And um, I was taking courses in philosophy and in, in, in bioethics in order to kind of try to make my uh, head around the various issues and ways, ways forward. Uh, then I realized that bioethics is particularly well suited to deal with some of those questions because of the way uh, medicine and biomedicine and, uh, you know, uh, pharmacy and so on has evolved over the, um, the last 50 years. Uh, medical research, bioresearch more generally uh, has uh, prompted bioethics to think about the various issues concerning the human condition uh, in the, and the interaction between it and, uh, and science and actually has grappled with most of them around autonomy, dignity and so on. So I thought this should be the way going forward for me. Thank you so much for such a thorough response, uh, Desi. Uh, my next question is to, to Sunny and, and or Adam, either of you can answer or, or you can add, you know, uh, what was, what is your favorite part of, uh, what has been the favorite part for you about the bioethics program thus far and also for someone who has traveled from in your case Annie, from toronto from canada and in in your case also adam from the uk all the way to you can go first Annie. sure thanks costi for that question um i think there's just been so many of favorite little moments um while being in this program and the first one i don't think this is exclusive to just being an in-person student um, i'm pretty sure virtual as well is just like the really enriching conversations that we have every day um, during our classes before classes after classes um, I think that our cohort has been so partic in particularly um, very just welcoming and um, very inclusive of any type of dialogue. And so that has been just every every class every day has been a really um, very precious moment that I hold. Thank you. Would you like to add to that, Adam, and also maybe the perspective from coming all of the way over from across the pond to Boston for this program? Yeah, so I think wrapped up in that question is um, really a, a question of, of community. And I, I was, of course, apprehensive about uh, about coming over to Harvard. It's a, a completely different continent for me and, and uh, a bit scary. But uh, the community that has been uh, developed and, and nurtured, fostered by, by the the Harvard team, the bioethics team, it is really second to none. Um, the the warmth that I feel towards my uh, my cohort is is something that I'll take with me forever. Um, that coupled with um, look, I had a high expectation expectations of of, of Harvard. That it comes with a certain prestige, but the teaching really has has lived up to it, um, and uh, the the manner in which they uh, they communicate ideas and force you to grapple with the big questions uh, has really lived up to those 
fairly high expectations um but it, i definitely think it's the community it's it's the my other students uh, that I, that I, i've learned to love and and will for for the rest of my days Thank you so much, Adam. And we all feel the warmth uh, from you and uh, from you also as a pediatrician with uh, a keen interest in, in matters that, that are such so important. Uh, Rigo, I wanted to ask you, um, when you started the program, what are some of the challenges you faced with managing schoolwork on one hand and then your professional work on the other? That is a very good question question Kosti. As a, as a Catholic priest, I am the associate pastor of the second largest parish in the Diocese of Harrisburg. And uh, besides having those responsibilities at the parish, I also have responsibilities in my order as a Capuchin uh, Franciscan. And so I feel like I, I was being pulled from left and right every single time. But also it was a choice that I made to to study bioethics. And so I had to be accountable for, for those choices I made and I had to make out the time. So this came with a lot of sacrifice. I had to draw a scale of preference to see what are my priorities? Is it um, having more fun or spending more time, you know, doing my reading assignments when I have some free time? And, and that's pretty much how I, I could balance everything. So did all my duties as, a, as an associate pastor during the day in the morning this entails hospital visits and uh i i made sure that my classes were always in the evening already the foundational classes are structured such that they come later in the evening from 7 to 9 p.m so that way most people who are part-time and are working they have the opportunity to to still attend to their daily lives and then go to class in the evening of course it demands more energy because you're already tired from the day's work and you still have to give in your best, you know, in class. But being in that environment where everyone is coming from the same situation, everyone is working, we knew that we were supported by each other. And because of their presence, you felt you could be there and do it. And um, yeah, so the, I mean, the first two weeks was something new, but by the time a month was over, it was part of your routine and everything has just been the bed of roses ever since then. Sympathize with many of of what you, and since I'm also in similar in similar situation, being a part time uh, working full time uh, at the same time. Uh, can you still hear me? Okay, sorry. Okay, a, a question for uh, for Sunny. Uh, what unique perspectives have you heard? or your uh, classmates who have been in mid-career or beyond. Uh... Thanks, uh, Kosti. So um, I, I, I am a little early in my career. I worked three years prior to entering um, the program, but I believe that my, despite still um, three years of my clinical experience has really, um, worked really well in terms of helping me kind of think about my perspectives, but also really helping to learn about from other people's perspectives and merging those to kind of um, go beyond um, our coursework and think about what really the work of bioethics is. Um, and I can only speak on like, I guess, more of like the clinical experiences that I've been able to have, but learning from those who are in mid or even late career has been really um, vital and crucial to kind of supplementing my thought processes and um, have been really, really enriching. So um, I think we learn from each other every day and we bring in these perspectives where we're able to kind of consider, oh, I really haven't thought about that, but that's a really good point. Oh, that's a really interesting perspective um, that you bring in. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ponder about that a little bit more. Um, so I think that it really has benefited me as a clinician, as a student. Um, so yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I realized I had the slight audio issue. Hopefully this is better. I just switched to my backup. Uh, I have a question for for Adam. Um, Adam, what, uh, you know, when you started the program, what are some of the challenges, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I apologize, uh, 
how has your experience living in the Boston area? I know we touched upon that a little bit, but how has your experience living in the Boston area outside of the coursework and the program itself been? Uh, so great, great question, uh, Kosti. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to say that um, the the Harvard How I live in Harvard Housing. Um, if there's any international students that are thinking of applying, uh, it really was a very smooth process. Harvard um, obviously has a huge amount of international students, so you're not going to be uh, the first. Uh, any problems that you have uh, it, that you do encounter, it won't be the first time. Um, and Harvard really did help me. Um, or guide me through the the, the visas, um, uh, welcoming me to to uh, Cambridge and and to to Boston in general. And Boston is just a, a fantastic place to explore, um, and it's certainly one of the value added bits of uh, this course. Or, or me as an international student doing this course uh, has enriched me. See, seeing the 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 fall or the autumn. Um, uh, has been utterly beautiful. There's so much to do in Boston that I, I feel like I've only scrape the surface um, but uh, Harvard really has has guided me through any any technical logistical challenges of, of moving continent um, and I'm sure that they will do the same for any any prospective students. Excellent thank you so much I, and I know I know that Carolyn is also here has joined Carolyn I, I'm not sure if your audio and video are still okay but if they are would you mind uh, telling us how can this program help professionally? Uh, that's a great question. So I am more of a mid-career student in the second year of the uh, two-year um, part-time program. Um, and I'm a lawyer by training. Um, I've practiced as a lawyer uh, both in politics and in, non in the nonprofit world. Um, and so this uh, is, you know, I, I joined this program to it. Um, and uh, first of all, just intellectually, it's been a ton of fun. So um, even if that's all I got out of it, uh, you know, quite frankly, I'd be happy. But it really has provided a number of opportunities. So for example, um, you know, because of being in this program, uh, I've been able to join an IRB over at uh, one of the hospitals. So uh, the other thing is I've been invited to be a guest lecturer. Um, at an area law school in their bioethics and the law course that's being taught in the spring. Um, and all of those, I would say both the credential of this program, but also the con networking connections that I've made from this program have all sort of helped me to create these opportunities to sort of going more in the bioethics path in my career. So it's been great. Excellent. Um, thank you so much. Uh, let's see. We still have, we're doing well with time, right? So we still have uh, some very uh, unique questions here for the panel, and hopefully they're all going to be very uh, relevant to everyone who is joining this webinar and who is looking into applying to the program. Um, I know we're all biased, but we can say that this has been an amazing experience and probably the best program we could have ever imagined. And actually it exceeded, in, personally it exceeded my expectations. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask is, of course, as you have seen from the panel, but also from bioethics as a field, uh, there have been you know, so many different perspectives that individuals bring into from their own initial profession. So I, this is a question for anyone who wants to jump in first. So I'm respecting your autonomy. Uh, how, uh, how have those different perspectives that different people within our cohort bring uh, has shaped your own perspectives uh, in ways that you wouldn't have uh, thought it would in the course of this? Master of Bioethics, Master of Science in Bioethics program. Let me see who's going to unmute themselves first. Great. So I, I think um, one of the, the the great things is is that we've got such a diverse um, uh, cohort of people studying, um, as well as such a diverse faculty. Uh, there are faculty members that are vets. There are faculty members that work in big pharma, that, um, and and the cohort is even more sort of broad we, journalists and uh, physicians nurses and and um, engineers um, 
and to, to learn how their life experiences have um, made them come to very different conclusions to the rest of us um, at, at times um, has been has been a pleasure. Um, and learning to articulate that in a respectful community um, really has really bolstered my belief in 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 the work of bioethics and and how and how we can all work together to 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 seek solutions to um the big questions that we're grappling with um we we don't shy away from those difficult questions and we have to learn to articulate them and and, and defend our view um and and harvard really does does offer the space to do that in in a in a kind often jovial way um whether it be talking about pistachio ice cream or or um playing games um with with difficult things uh, about people's uh, uh hypothetical situations about uh, scenarios in hospitals and things so um i think that that's really the the, the crux of it thank you thank you so much for this uh, response uh let me let me go with uh, Desi. Uh, I have a question for you, and I know we've been on one of the consortia together uh, on uh, health policy. And with your policy from the European side, the, uh, what new uh, new or exciting, let's say, or maybe sometimes you know challenging differences have you uh, have you encountered? while delving deeper into these issues from the American perspective uh, that, that influence or shape or inform your own view of things regarding health policy. Thank you, Kosti. I think one of the really valuable takeaways for me um, has been the evidence-based research that some of the scholars um, at our faculty are conducting and we are presented with either as required readings or uh, during during discussions and consortia. These are um, extremely telling in various ways and they help me uh, reach certain gaps across the ocean, but also I think they teach me uh, what is really valuable research, what is, uh, what is a research that could contribute in a meaningful way to the public debate. Um, other aspects, I think, are around the way um, the U.S. more broadly, but also the, the, the research community at American University uh, approaches um, very salient research questions uh, with both public health, but also ethical dimensions around, you know, uh, organ donation or um, the opioid crisis or, uh, you know, um, patient uh, research subjects and so on, uh, always uh, in very specific terms that essentially fleshes out very well what the actual concerns are, be it ethical or policy. This relates at least to me, but I'm sure also with most of my colleagues very well because kind of uh, hits the nail on, on the head and provides very specific tangible dimensions to the issues that uh, no matter where we are based, we all will be grappling with. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Rigo, uh, I know we have uh, uh, we have been in many wonderful and very rich conversations with our faculty and our peers many times, oftentimes way past after our, our actual end time for the, it were, whether it, were, it be a course, uh, a tutorial uh, or, or a consortium, but as from those conversations with your peers and faculty, what has it been something that most excites you regarding the field of bioethics? One thing that has made a tremendous impact on me in this program is the ability to be open to the consideration of other perspectives, something which Dr. Barry will concur that that is so dear to her heart. And um, we were first exposed to that in our Foundation One course. And uh, that is something that coming into the program, I did not necessarily utilize in my daily life. And uh, as a Catholic priest, I, I mean, I definitely have some natural strong positions on certain issues, but when it comes to bioethics, 
now I've come to realize that there's no one firm answer on any particular issue. It's a case by case uh, scenario. And uh, we go about navigating how to give the adequate recommendation for, for that issue. And so being able to consider other perspectives uh, paying attention to opinions and not necessarily the persons are uh, uh, skills that I've really picked up. And each time that I'm in a conversation, either with a faculty or with a peer, that is always at the back of my mind. I need to listen to what they're saying, even if it's different from mine. And you know, just kind of bounce it off of my own idea and see what am I missing? What are some of the gaps? And so that has stayed with me. It's going to be a part of me no matter what I do. Um, whether it's in my ministry as a priest or it's in my future endeavors in the bioethical field. Excellent, thank you so much. And you know, I was trying to make sure that I'm listening fully to what you were saying because this is a, exactly something that our faculty members, especially you know, uh, our director, Dr. Brindel, and our associate uh, faculty director, Dr. Berry, has have really taught us and they have taught us really well I might add on how to to do that and be respectful and use empathy and trying to uh, to be good bioethicist essentially uh, you know once once we're out of this program thinking about the latter part once our next step after graduation and for you Sunny you're closer to our early earlier year uh, Colleague, you're a registered nurse by trade. You've done work with uh, children with disabilities uh, that I know, and it's also near and dear to my heart as well. What is it that you hope to do using your degree after you graduate? Uh, and also, what do you want to do, um, and how will this degree help you accomplish? Uh, thanks, Costi. So, I think um, what really compelled me to initially uh, apply for this program was uh, the experiences that I had in my um, at, at, at work and it really compelled me to really become a little bit more knowledgeable and know what skill sets um, that are required to be a really good um, like have, to have a really good practice in consideration of what ethics is and so, and then with this program, I was paired with really tremendous mentors, advisors, um, those that have been really pivotal to my experience in the program. And it's kind of shifted me to think of an idea of becoming like a clinical ethicist um, in which my nursing background would very much well supplement. And so um, upon reflection, I think that's the career path or career pivot that I'm going to take. And um, upon uh, getting advice from my advisors and mentors, um, they have kind of pushed me to apply to like fellowships um, and or actual like clinical ethicist positions across um, the United States and Canada. So that's what I'm currently doing. Thank you. And, and we have a couple of uh, uh, closing questions, at least as, as far as the panel is concerned. Um, one question for you, Adam, is similar, but uh, uh, during the program, both inside or outside the program, um, and then and what, what were some of the favorite moments that you've had, but also how have those experiences, those favorite moments, again, and experiences, uh, influenced the work that you do uh, and yet that you will be doing in your role as a pediatrician? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I certainly joined the program because uh, paediatrics is is um, is fraught with ethical dilemmas, uh, of which I was seeing many in my own clinical practice. And I think that looking to the future uh, in so many different disciplines, uh, these big questions are going to rear their heads. And uh, I feel that um, people such as ourselves, if you've logged on, then you're certainly going to be um, one of those people that uh, needs to be at the forefront of grappling those those um, uh, difficulties, whether that's in engineering or medicine or uh, uh, journalism or or, or policy making. Um, I, I think that uh, the MBE program has really given us a, a foundation for that. Um, and my favourite, <laughs> I I feel feel like a broken record, but um, my favourite part is to learn from uh, from my colleagues. Um, we've got young um, uh, students, and we've got uh, uh, more mature students 
uh, who um, are coming with such a wealth of their experience. And that coupled with um, the, the young eyes of, of uh, the young who, who can uh, that give ambitious proposals that we, we all used to have um, and, and we should perhaps still strive for. Um, and, and that coupled, uh, that sort of duality is just fantastic that we, we, can, um, we can bring that um, not, not sort of older, more tarnished folk that say, oh, no, that, that will never work. We, we, have, to, we have to think of the, the, big, uh, the bigger questions and, and uh, the community um, guided by, by the, the faculty ha has fulfilled that. Um, in my later career, I hope to, uh, to, to be able to take what I've learned from the bioethical sphere. I, I think this might just be a stepping stone and I, I, um, I want to pursue further, further studies in, in bioethics um, and it, it, to be an integral part of, of my future career. And, and I think that um, the things that I'm learning here and the contacts that I'm making, uh, that will be um, uh, easily done. Very well said, Adam. Uh, final question for Rigo and or Desi. And of course, anyone else can, can jump in because it's more broad and, and general. But I know there are advantages and disadvantages or probably advantages rather for both the full-time program in one year as well as advantages for the part-time uh, two-year program. For those who are in the part-time program, so like uh, what was one thing uh, you would change in terms of adding a course or choosing a different course or experience during your time here uh, that you haven't had a chance to do given the, the breadth and the depth of uh, and the richness of all the wonderful uh, options that we have had. Rigo, why don't you start first? So I know that there's a plethora of courses that are of interest to me, but at the same time, you can only do a certain amount of uh, courses each semester. And um, I don't necessarily think that I would change anything because I have enjoyed every single course I have taken up to this point. As a matter of fact, the courses that I wish I could add, but I, I'm unable to do that. And I, another advantage of being in the virtual part-time program, well, in the part-time program is that I didn't feel the pressure of trying to get a capstone topic uh, right away so i had an entire year to work on that and i responded to someone just uh, from the, in, the, in the chat question i got my topic following a paper i wrote for my clinical ethics class so sometimes you may come in with an idea but you start taking classes and it exposes you to other alternatives i didn't think of before and um, by the end of the first semester or the second semester, you now have clarity on what you want to work on. So that that's an advantage that I notice as a part-time uh, student. And um, one caveat in being a part-time student virtually will be the the social part. You know, you know, sometimes when you're in a classroom at the end of class, you may want to hang around with your peers and the professors and maybe continue a topic that, that arose in class. But even in the virtual space, that's still there's still room to do that. You know, often, uh, you know, like with the foundation uh, courses, uh, Dr. Barry, uh, Dr. Brendel, they always stayed back for an additional 15, 20 minutes, just waiting for any students who have some final thoughts to, to share. And so it has really been a a positive experience for me being in a part-time uh, virtual program and also I try to make uh, it a, a duty of mine to come to campus once every semester just to be there because you know I, I feel like being in that environment so changes like your your psyche and and so I will advise you to consider coming to campus even if you're in a virtual program. Thank you so much Rigo. Uh, Desi and any comments from you and then Caroline if if you are uh, back if you want to add a final comment from on your behalf as well thank you Kosti I'll be brief I second Rigo um, the program is so rich that I would recommend everyone just to simply take their time and be realistic about their schedules um, what may be an additional option for for 
for some of them, I'm also considering uh, considering it for, for myself is to extend the virtual program for two to three years. I'm not sure whether we've talked about this, but there is an option to actually um, uh, take a third year as part of the virtual program. Um, I think this may be helpful for people working full-time or being full-time moms, dads, and also wanting to enjoy um, the, 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 the possibility to really delve into the, 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 uh, all the topics, the learnings, allocate enough time and also be able to take more courses if that's an option. So um, this is probably a change one could think about. Otherwise, everything on offer is so outstanding, at least in my view, that I don't think anyone would regret any of, uh, of their choices of courses or options. Caroline, thank you, Desi. Caroline. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't, um, I sort of, I'm going to echo my previous two um, uh, people. Of, I wouldn't change anything. I think what I would put a plug in for is I, I, I echo what Rigo said of it's a treat when you're in the part time program of having a little more time to um, develop and come up with your capstone proposal. Because I think what I, you know, when you're in the, the two year part time program, you don't, um, really launch your capstone until the second year. And so I think I really, I did change as Rigo was saying too, um, what I might have come up with when I first came in. Um, but I think what I would really say I loved is I took a wide variety of classes and I tried to push myself to take the stuff that was outside my um, background early on. So clinical ethics, which is a required class for me, you know, it's a very, it, it's a much more, um, uh, medical class, for example, than say the health law policy class in terms of my familiarity with some of the terms and the readings. Um, I took it early on and, and it was great because it really stretched me and, you know, and it was, it stretched me. And at the same time, the professor was so clear about being available for, you know, any and all questions that I'm sure to the doctors in the room were ridiculous, but I needed to ask. Um, but I took from environmental ethics to animal ethics to pediatric ethics to reproductive ethics. Um, I'm doing a religion class now. I mean, really a wide, wide variety. Um, and and I'm glad that, and the program, and I'll take even, I'm doing genomics in the spring. I mean, there's such a wide variety that's offered. And I just, you know, for those who are, who do end up enrolling, I highly encourage you to really take advantage of that breadth of classes um, because it is, you know, this opportunity to really, get such an amazing um, range of, to learn from an amazing range of people and, and learn about so many different topics. And, uh, and it's been a treat. Excellent, thank you so much. And, and I know we could be you know, talking for hours about the, the, our passion, which is, or our new passion for some, which is now bioethics. Uh, but I know also that we have been having, uh, you know, an increased flow of questions. So probably Jesse can uh, take it on. And thank you so much uh, to all of you. And thank you to our faculty and to Jesse and Samantha for allowing us to share our experiences with everyone else. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Kosti. Great questions and great answers, everybody. So now we would like to uh, answer some of your questions that you've been asking throughout the session. And there's one in particular that I thought we could start with, um, and any current student is totally welcome to answer this. I think it would be great coming for you, coming from you. Um, so here's a question. My professional background and primary area of interest is in hospice and palliative care and the regulatory framework pertaining to this field. Does this program explore end of life issues? So absolutely. Yes, it does. Is there any student who would like to take that question on? Um, I mean, I can say that's at least uh, at least one whole um, conversation in clinical ethics just to start. Um, it's also coming up in my religion uh, and you know religious ethics class. I think it's numerous places. Uh, you know, the Asians so touch a number of those issues. I think it's such a um, it's such a large issue these days, quite frankly. It comes up in a number of classes and explored in depth, I think, from a variety of different perspectives in my experience. And I could probably add that uh, indeed there is a separate class on this in the public health and policy uh, course as well. 
uh, as well as this theme pop pops up quite often in other types of discussions, including on in foundations of bioethics, when we, we essentially try to look at those issues from various perspectives, from the perspectives of various ethical theories, which actually is quite uh, enriching uh, and, and informative in various ways. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Um, and two more questions here. And um, they re they relate to being a, a clinician um, and how this program can influence your career. So Adam and Sonny, from a clinical practitioner perspective, uh, how does the program of the MBE, how, how has this changed your views past, present, uh, or future practices? Um, yeah, so every, everyone comes to the course with um, with a different set of experiences, a different set of uh, tools in their backpack that that they use to 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 grapple with with bioethical um, conundrums from from their their profession. Um, what this course really does do is, and and it fulfilled a, a basic need of mine, is to to break it down to the sort of the basic philosophical uh, issues. And so we learn a little bit about how the philosophy comes into it through my colleagues. I'm learning about um, different countries and how their legal system has has grappled with those, but then more importantly it's really brought to, together um different perspectives of of how clinically we can seek resolution for for our patients for the the ones that we care for and that, that um uh, we are charged with with uh, looking after and i think that that has been absolutely integral it's not only just the course the, the whole community at uh, Harvard, whether it be over at the Harvard Law School or the, the School of Philosophy or um, the other centers of, of, of bioethics here. There is the Center of Bioethics, but there's also the, the Lee Safra um, uh, Center that you can go and attend uh, uh, conferences and discussions um, and, and learn from, from everyone um, across the world because this is an international community. Um, and I think that taking that forward taking my new perspectives and the perspectives of, of frankly the world won't um won't limit me and in fact will in, enrich the conversation when I when I go back to London and 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 share what I've what I've learned and um just to add on to what Adam has said um I think I think what's really important and to be cognizant about is that um, at least for me was that um I, I came in with like one perspective, although I tried to be very well rounded um, it, I do only come with one perspective and so that supplementation from various other um, like roles professionals and and whatnot, um, it really adds on to the the knowledge base and um, the foundation of what you perceived it to be initially. And then I think regarding just like future practices just to kind of add on to what Adam said. Um, it, I think bioethics is an ever evolving field. There's always going to be um, new topics and discussion, new considerations. And I think with this degree, it really kind of helps you um, to think of various approaches of how you might um, integrate like various cultural, social um, differences, similarities, and ways to be just a little bit more cognizant about it, in addition to um, being more aware about um, how different people perceive things and whatnot. Great. Thanks so much, Sunny and Adam. Uh, those were really wonderful perspectives. Um, do you think we could just a lot, a, a minute or two, um, maybe two of you could talk about what you're doing um, with your capstone, uh, what made you want to do that and where you hope to take it? And Costi, you're welcome to answer this as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So I, I can start. And uh, so my capstone is looking into uh, a field that has not been uh, very much discussed in the literature. It has to do with adaptive sports and adaptive sport medicine within a rehabilitation setting. And specifically, more specifically, it's looking into the triads among the clinician, the coach slash trainer, and the patient, and how this dynamic and very unique relationship uh, for, especially for patients who have uh, suffered some kind of an injury or disease, and hence they have a disability, either you know, 
congenital or a new disability, newly acquired disability that they're now in the process of rehabilitating. Uh, and then what are the organizational and clinical ethical issues that arise through such a triadic relationship as well as in the specific setting, uh, which is in my case, the Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital, one of the many teaching affiliates of Harvard Medical School. Um, and, and of course, this aligns a little bit with, uh, or, or more, I would, I would say, with my fellowship that has to do with uh, equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging. And this is uh, particularly important for bioethics since it touches upon the justice principle and specifically within justice, social justice, that is a huge area when it comes to inclusion and access and ableism and the notions of uh, expert mercy and accompaniment uh, that we learned from the late and great Paul Farmer. Uh, but yeah, the capstone is so, is, is so exciting, I believe for all of us. But for me in particular, this is something that I always wanted to do. And now I can finally do that because of this program. Thanks so much, Kosti. Would anyone else like to share? I can jump in. So my, my capstone research is uh, identifying moral distress and moral injury among healthcare chaplains. Now, uh, moral, moral distress, it's a condition, it's a mental condition that occurs when a, a moral agent is unable to exercise their personal and core values and beliefs due to internal or external constraints. And uh, moral injury, on the other hand, arises when a person uh, is betrayed morally due to an observation of uh, someone in authority uh, not doing what uh, they were supposed to do. And uh, these two conditions predominantly during COVID-19 were started among clinicians. And um, my research is really going to be novel because I identified that there was purposely in the literature with regards to these conditions among healthcare chaplains. And uh, I am engaging this topic because it's gonna train me also on doing research. So I'm going through the IRB track, which it's not, an absolute requirement for the capstone, but I received the permission to engage in it because he was going to give me further training on doing uh, scientific uh, research moving forward. And in my capstone, I'm able to apply some of the, the tools that I got from research ethics and, um, and clinical ethics. So everything is kind of coming together with my capstone. And I, I hope to you know eventually get the results published because as I said, it's it's novel and the skills that I will learn from this capstone will help me engage in future research, especially when I do my PhD work. Well, <clears throat> thanks so much, Rigo. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me, we do have to begin wrapping up here, but uh, before we do, I would like to introduce Dr. Rebecca Brendel. Um, she's the director of the Master of Bioethics program and the associate director here at the Center for Bioethics. And Dr. Brendel, I was wondering, um, we do have a bunch of questions left, and I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but I think it would be immensely helpful um, if you could tell us a little bit about what you've seen some of our alumni go on to do and what are some of the career paths and career prospects. Well, let me um, first start by thanking um, you, Jesse, and our phenomenal education team for uh, the creativity in uh, showcasing uh, the very, very best part of our program, which is the community that we get to create together uh, through our faculty and students and our interactions with each other. And um, just to say that we are continually marveled by our students. Um, uh, I joked, but I wasn't kidding that uh, the sign of success was uh, our having created a program that none of us couldn't could have gotten into if we applied today because of the incredible accomplishment, talents, brilliance, and uh, and personal warmth warmth and empathy of each and every one of our students. So um, I'm humbled every day by the incredible things that our alumni are doing. So from working at the bedside to making difference a difference one by one 
uh, with patients and families in difficult situations to working through other professions with uh, through um, legal advocacy uh, with individual uh, clients and people um, in difficult situations to writing policy um, that shows up on the desk of our senator uh, when we're there doing a, a briefing um, on health policy to uh, thinking about and shaping our systems and combating systemic and structural racism and oppression. Uh, thinking about a per, an issue that of particular concern in the um, U.S. right now around uh, gender equity and reproductive health, um, and really engaging in every area of bioethics. So now I'm thinking of all the hot button issues, and when we have students who are working in environmental ethics, um, I. Uh, I love the new year in part because it's a time when I get to hear from all our students who are, are doing things um, around the world. We have a student who's been in Ukraine, has had a lifetime career um, in uh, supporting um, uh, humanitarian um, missions uh, during times of war and natural disaster. We have other students who are now running bioethics centers themselves and, uh, and teaching and educating and, um, uh, and working to carry on the tradition. So there's really the potential is limitless. And um, this wonderful group of students today is really um, uh, uh, shows the diversity, the breadth um, and the commitment to advancing the work of bioethics. Thanks, Dr. Brindell, that was really helpful. Um, and so here we only have one minute left. There's only one more thing to really highlight, um, and that is our upcoming deadline is January 15th. So uh, I do believe that that's five days and comes up this weekend. January 15th, that is the deadline for early career applicants, okay? Well, if you're one to three years into your career. It is also going to apply to you if you are an international applicant applying to study full-time one year here in the United States, okay? And so that's coming up this weekend. For everybody else, if you're a mid-career professional, if you're international mid-career and you're applying uh, to study part-time, that's going to be March 15th, okay? And I'll put that in chat. And also some tips. If you are, are indeed now looking to apply for this weekend, um, or if you want to go back and look at your application, um, <clears throat> right, it's entirely online. We want to see your transcripts from all of your institutions, um, an updated and reviewed CV or your resume, um, as well as a statement of purpose that's going to tell us you know, why do you care about bioethics? Why do you want to study that here at the medical school? Why it's important to you, what you can do with it and where you can take it. Um, it is a hundred dollar application fee and all of the test scores are optional with the exception of if you're an international applicant and the language of instruction was not English, then we will want to see some TEFL scores uh, or Duolingo scores. And if you are anxious about the time um, for, English proficiency exams, the Duolingo exam usually I think takes about an hour or two and you'll get your scores pretty much immediately, maybe a day. So that is always our recommendation. Um, lastly, I know we didn't get to talk about a lot, but we do have a recorded information session uh, from December 7th, okay? And that's on YouTube, that's on our center channel. And so you can find a lot of really great information there. Dr. Brindell and Dr. Barry also spoke a lot during that if you wanted to hear more perspectives from some of our directors. Um, you can always email us. Let me put that in the chat really quick. And if you have any questions, email us there, and then we'll be back to you uh, within a couple of days. And lastly, thank you all. Thank you all You know so much for attending. Uh, huge shout out to our current students. This was super wonderful. I know it took time out of your days, but we really enjoyed it. Um, and I know already that it was really helpful. So thank you so much, everybody, um, and have a lovely day. Bye-bye.